a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor uh, Phil Kotler. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, I want to start with um, uh, two questions. Uh, the first is, how old is marketing? And the second is, how old is social marketing? So how old is marketing? Now, you can go back to Adam and Eve, and you know, know there's a certain sales situation in Adam and Eve. <laughs> so let's say sales and selling was, is very old. There was no use of the word marketing until the 1900s. The first time we saw that term, we, by the way, the term market is old. It goes way back to the ancient Greeks, you know, the, just the marketplace. Uh, but it started in, uh, we started to see textbooks called marketing written by disillusioned economists who thought there was more to influencing demand than changing the price of something. They recognized that advertising is lifting demand and sales force is lifting demand. And um, so marketing is about 110 years old. So it's a new field. Social marketing, how old is social marketing? Uh, someone said 42, good. That's, uh, then I'm not presumptuous in saying that it started with an article that Jerry Zaltman and I wrote uh, in 1971. So we're really celebrating the 42nd birthday today of social marketing. Although I would allow that uh, there were people doing social marketing before that article appeared. Um, uh, with respect to problems like population, uh, well, family planning, uh, and smoking and other things. I think what got Jerry and myself interested in this is we were interested in making uh, the world better through marketing, but in that uh, time, what Jerry and I meant before writing the article is by doing good commerce, commercial work. Uh, marketers should feel the dignity of making a contribution because we're creating more goods and services for people to use and enjoy. So. Let's say it is the purpose of marketing to create a better world. But then we, Jerry and I, began to think about the problem of drugs, the problem of smoking, overeating, obesity, and family planning. And we said, you know, maybe marketing can make a, a contribution in that uh, way, too. So we began to write the article. and. The subtitle was A Planned Approach to Social Planning or something like that. It's a, 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 a social, an approach to planned change. I better get the word change in a couple of times. And it was not about unplanned social change. It was about planned social change. So social marketing, what it really lacks and still needs, uh, comes out of this expression, creating a better world through marketing, so what's a better world? What are we trying to maximize? What makes, what, the, at least the economists have the uh, idea that their whole field is about at least corporate economics. How do you maximize profits? I guess we could talk about maximizing social profits too, but I think what we need is a, a central word. And I think uh, yesterday there was an excellent talk about different ways to talk about happiness and other things, and maybe it's well-being. The word wellness came up. Maybe we're all in the business of contributing to well-being, and we, there's a whole history of, of, of that concept. There used to be in the 80s a lot of work on what was called social indicators. In other words, we would look at a nation and try to see um, how its, its health status, its educational status. By the way, we're getting very upset in the United States to discover that we're not number one in so many important things, uh, like uh, students uh, abroad, especially in Asia and in Finland and some places, 
they, they really perform mathematically. Uh, we're maybe 15 or 20 in the rankings of our students uh, with things like math and science and so on. And our health system is supposed to be one of the best in the world. We got ourselves to believe that. But uh, it's, uh, it's the most expensive way to get a health system with outcomes that are not better than many other countries in terms of their outcomes. So we're learning. So I want to get into this question of the larger context for social marketing because uh, we should put some boundaries around anything we, we do. Uh, what's, for example, is the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, that took place, uh, is that social marketing? Uh, or is that a social movement? Uh, and, and we'll try to put a context, a broader context around what is social marketing. Now, the reason for these two books um, is because uh, they, they cover two very important areas. One is public health, and the other is protecting the environment. And uh, as projects, um, we, we, need, we need people to put together for each aspect of the society the best we know. Uh, any one author could have put a great book out on public health and another author a great book out on environment. So what we decided to do originally was going to be more like finding the best articles that have been written. Because that's a typical type of reader. It's a reader book. You just uh, uh, choose the very best things that have been said and put, and, and put them together. We did something else where we said, no, we want to have original articles written, and we know who the experts are. So when it comes to public health, we know who can write the best, bring us best up to date with an article that would be written for us for this special occasion um, on, let's say, obesity as a problem and some of the other topics on that. In, in the case of the environment book, we actually went to good cases that had been written up of real exploits to improve the environment, and then we um, redid the cases. We went to the people who wrote the cases. We started to get new data, and so it was, again, original writing rather than just a reader, and I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Now, let's go to this question of the context. Um, there's six things I want to distinguish, and the rest of my talk is to go into each one and show you how each one differs from, there's only one that is about social marketing. And the first one that we start with is laissez-faire. And laissez-faire is, uh, is not a, a, a marketing kind of thing. It really says let, let, let the system run the way it is. Uh, be libertarian in thinking about what's happening. Don't try to influence other people. The system, leave, leave people with liberty to do whatever they want. They want to be heavy and, uh, rather than slim if they want to smoke. So we should start with what is a libertarian position and, and so on. Um, actually, I had a conversation with a libertarian recently, and he says, I, I think all this social marketing, you, you have no right to do that. It's unethical. You're, you're interfering with my beliefs, my practices. Uh, why don't you just mind your own business? And so on. So there's that quality uh, in laissez-faire, too. So let's move on to something that isn't laissez-faire, where it's already beginning to manifest the interest of us as social beings in influencing other people. And I'll say that uh, this is very common. It's, we'll call it social persuasion. It's not yet social marketing. It's usually not uh, heavily communication oriented. It doesn't understand a full context of how people behave and react to uh, situations. It just sort of says uh, we're going to give some arguments for a certain kind of behavior. And so in terms of the 4P idea, product, price, place, and promotion, social persuasion is just working with 1P uh, promotion. And yet it has a role to play. We see it in public service announcements. Uh, the Advertising Council of America will have nice posters about uh, save, uh, uh, what, who, who's the bear again, that, uh, so we don't have forest fires, Smokey the bear, and things like that. There's, 
And there's one, those, are, uh, those ads are very um, uh, helpful to see. Uh, a lot of short messages, don't drink when driving. Uh, the conclusion is that um, they have some role to play, but probably doesn't change much behavior. It's not really focused. Behavior is more, uh, gonna be more ab about lots of other things than simply hearing a message. So we'll move on to a thing we could call social innovation. Um, and there, maybe I should have called it social technology. There, maybe we can change behaviors without face-to-face -face persuasion by creating systems that um, help people avoid bad behaviors. Uh, for example, we can measure breath, um, alcoholic breaths, uh, and maybe uh, anyone going into a car who just drank a lot can't start the car. Uh, how do we get people to wear their seat belt? Uh, do you remember the cars that actually automated the belt going around you? Um, I don't know why that stopped. Maybe we found that enough people were going to do it on their own so we didn't have to have a, it done for them. Uh, car, uh, car alarms r will ring when you get too close to another car. This is gonna be especially important because now we're getting into driverless cars uh, that ought to be probably ringing all the time as you get close. Uh, car phones uh, programmed to ring and remind you to take a pill. Uh, the physicians tell me that the level of compliance with pills that people are supposed to take is about 40%. So how do we uh, help people? Uh, and we could actually have medical uh, offices uh, have a phone system relationship to the patient where it uh, actually uh, phones the patient about taking a pill or, or their cell phone does. Uh, additional reminders, prompts, nudges. There's a, a field emerging in somewhat contrast to the four Ps. We think, uh, Nancy Lee and I think that uh, everything can be put under product, price, place, and promotion. Um, and uh, the other side says, no, there's a set of things that don't easily get into there, and you'd rather think about um, putting prompts that sort of trigger uh, an interest in the behavior, a uh, nudge, uh, where you uh, create a, uh, the way you even create the architecture of choice, as they, it's called, uh, may lead people to make uh, better choices. Um, so Social innovation is the term I use. We could call it micro-social engineering, social design, social architecture. But let's move on. So what makes up social marketing? Um, well, the original message was it's all about trying to influence behavioral change or maybe behavioral maintenance, ma maintaining a certain behavior or changing a certain behavior. But the idea was uh, behavior. And um, uh, to say, there was a little difference between saying, I'm gonna be ha I want the capability to change someone's behavior or I want the capability to influence a change in their behavior. And um, the benefits, uh, uh, we learned a lot from commercial marketing, uh, which is very active in trying to influence purchases um, and attitudes. Uh, now, how many social marketers are there? And I threw in a wild number. 10,000, I, I, don't, I don't think it's ever been measured. I think there's a 500, I know there's 500 social marketers because we have a visible evidence of that here. Um, but we know that there are many people working in many countries uh, doing what we would define as social marketing. They're preparing campaigns and so many governments uh, are wanting us to uh, you know, eat more sensibly and exercise. So there must be a lot of people, whether they're self-consciously calling themselves social marketers or not, they are busy doing this. And of course, we, we uh, had made some forays uh, historically into organizations like the World Bank, um, the uh, Center for Disease Control, um, the United Nations. In other words, the term social marketing came up uh, at different times in these uh, institutions. And uh, I just yesterday talked with some of you and found out uh, we sort of lost mentions now. It's not like we're actively mentioned. And maybe it's the word marketing that still is the turnoff. Uh, and they're doing social marketing, but without the word. I'm sure that's happening. 
uh, the speaker yesterday, who's from Brazil, said that uh, there's a lot of resistance uh, because even the word marketing is a bad word in Brazil, not uh, just social marketing. I mean, the word marketing means maybe some manipulator is coming your way to uh, guide your, your, your preferences. So um, there's so many issues that have already been researched in our field. It's wonderful to have this uh, listserv cap capability every other day. I see someone ask, saying, I'm trying to get some evidence on uh, campaigns uh, against ob obesity, and where do I, do any of you in this wide, wide world, um, can you point me to some things to look at? So we're at a good stage uh, in social marketing, and I think we all understand what it is. So let's move on. Let's continue a little bit. If we were to change the name social marketing, if it for, uh, would, and the, the, the reason this might have come up is social media. Who ever thought in 1971 when we called something social marketing that it now would get, conf there would be a new term called social media coming up and some social media people are saying I do social marketing. They, but they mean they are manage, uh, they're good at media. So if that's a bad confusion, maybe we have to call this cause marketing. Uh, social cause marketing, uh, but let's leave that as a, a nice discussion um, in, in, in groups whenever you get together. Uh, what is the relationship between social marketing and health communications? Uh, it, it, well, health communications should be more limited because it sounds like it's just a communication approach without trying to develop better products and prices and, uh, and uh, places and all that. Um, in talking to Craig uh, Lefebvre just recently, uh, he went abroad and was talking, I guess, in Israel. And uh, what they asked him for is, Craig, uh, don't come here and tell us about social marketing, uh, but we have a problem. What's the problem? It's uh, health promotion. Uh, we want to improve our, our health promotion. We don't mean through advertising, but promoting better health. So that was the door that led to him coming, and then he introduces social marketing. So maybe if you may say that you're a person working on, health, on promoting better health, then of course you talk in terms afterwards on about what is social marketing? Isn't that the agency that could help us uh, achieve that? And now we have an international social marketing association, a European social marketing association, and so on. And that relates to another thing that's happening. Have you heard of the World Marketing Summit? Uh, let me say that in 2012, in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh, um, we had 60 speakers on sort of social marketing. Namely, we met to we met as 60 speakers and an audience of four thousand people in Bangladesh to help them work on their problem of poverty and hunger and poor education and women's rights, all the things that the United Nations cites in the Millennial Development Goals, goals established by the United Nations and voted on by all the nations positively, eight goals to make the world a better place. Unfortunately, the financial collapse uh, set us back because one of the goals was to cut poverty in half, and another goal was to cut hunger in half. So we didn't make it because it was supposed to be achieved by 2015. So when we met in Bangladesh, we were reviving the interest in addressing such problems, and that was called the World Marketing Summit. And we're having, there's going to be one in 2013 in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and there will be the next one in 2014 in uh, Bang Bangkok. Bangkok will be the permanent home of the World Marketing Summit. So I mentioned this to say that we're allies, we're partners. You're doing World Social Marketing Conference. Uh, a lot of, there are some issues you look at that we don't, a feature, uh, but they're so important. I mean, 
some, how do we stop kids from bullying others in play yards? Uh, how do we do a lot of very specific issues? We're not into that so much as sticking to how marketing and social marketing can help in um, big issues like poverty and, and um, uh, health, better education, women's rights, and so on. Okay. Um, the great contribution that Alan Andreessen made in, in stretching our thinking because there was a stage where we were just focusing on how to help an individual eat better, uh, exercise more. Downstream social marketing, which is still maybe the heart of what many of your uh, interests uh, are. But there's horizontal social marketing or peer-to-peer -peer social marketing. How can we um, reach uh, our neighbors and so on? And then there's upstream social marketing. How can we influence the institutions that um, affect uh, us when, uh, with food, let's say, and that would be, of course, the school systems and the restaurants and the producers of food. All of you know about that development. And maybe we should be moving more toward some upstream work and seeing what we can do. And why do I say that? Because look at these problems, overfishing. Sometimes you're gonna wanna order grouper as a fish and then you find out, well, they've sort of closed grouper down because the supply is getting very limited. So for a few more months, there's no grouper around. Water pollution, forest destruction, and therefore we are saying maybe our audiences are legislators, associations, companies, social act activists. And by the way, there's uh, some people who are more active and activistic in their social marketing. Uh, Sal Alinsky ought to be reread a dozen times for how he helped organize groups to fight pollution and bad credit uh, systems and so on and so forth. Um, Ralph Nader and Gail Braith. So we have a lot of uh, examples of, um, of what you might call upstream social marketing, although I might actually say that they're more into social movements at least uh, Sal Alinsky would have been. We'll get to that. Uh, there's distinctions to be made between what is uh, advocacy um, and uh, what about lobbying and some other things, but time doesn't permit us um, looking at these adjacencies. These are things related to our, our work. Uh, and they say, how do we use advocacy? How do we use lobbying? Um, so what is a social movement? How, how do we say that there's something beyond social marketing, namely the creation of a social movement? And, it, it, and we know of social movements, collective bargaining, uh, we know environmental movement, the gay rights movement, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm gonna illustrate one that I worked on, and I wrote a paper, got it published in the Harvard Business Review called Consumerism, um, when you may recollect that there were very angry consumers back in the 70s and uh, there was a movement, there were uh, marches, believe it or not, there were consumers marching against companies and, uh, and how does a social movement take place? I mean, we're not, none of, none of us basically are maybe ambitious to make whatever you're doing into a whole social movement. And that means you're creating a a body of people to, well, as in the, uh, uh, in the um, one about the, the Wall Street, too. But in any case, for a social movement to come about, at least the one called the uh, consumerism, there had to be some readiness for a society to even consider it as a problem. Uh, and it was our advancing incomes, it was our advancing uh, technology, and our and exploitation of the environment sort of made our, some country, in this case the United States, maybe Canada to some extent, um, uh, ready to be even thinking that such a movement makes any sense. But then it was the strains. There were economic strains, people were, uh, inflation was high, there was social discontent over war and race, uh, ecological discontent, uh, the marketing system uh, itself produced some shoddy products, uh, some gimmicks and, and some dishonesty. So usually a social movement to be fertile 
to, to start, there has to be a lot of uh, frustration in, uh, in the system. That's not enough. You gotta articulate what it's about. Somehow you have to put a voice together on what we represent as a movement. And that voice is usually supplied by uh, writers. Uh, notice uh, that was the time when we had Rachel Carson uh, talking about the silent spring, namely water, our water, our streams of water were being polluted and so on. And we had Vance Packard talking about the hidden persuaders. Keith Fauver had a big com a committee and Senator Douglas uh, uh, raising questions, investigating. Uh, consumer organizations were, were forming and getting strong. Um, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith wrote about the affluent society, which is a joke in a sense because while we had personal wealth and affluence, we didn't have any parks to go to, we didn't have any roads we could really drive well on, and, and so there was this paradox of the public sector being starved and the private sector um, having affluence. So there were, now it still takes a trigger, a spark. Ralph Nader, and suddenly showing that Ford was spying on him and trying to sabotage him after he published his book, Unsafe at Any Speed. And other things were happening, the housewives uh, picketing and so on. That not, still nothing happens in a movement unless it goes to another stage that mass media finds, hey, we can sell more papers with this cause, which, uh, you know. Uh, happens and, and then some politicians make it their cause. That's important, how to get them behind this. And then uh, these consumer groups. And, and then the question is how does business react? How does Congress react? And a movement can die at that point. Um, or, or it could be joined by some Congress people and so on. All I'm saying by this illustration on consumerism is that it's almost like uh, uh, six different stages you pass through in trying to form a movement. Now there's one movement I've been trying to think about forming. It's more than social marketing. Uh, it would be a peace movement. Uh, I was uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and my hosts uh, at their home were the Bin Ladens. And you'd say, what are you doing with the Bin Ladens? Well, I was with the four brothers who hate the fifth brother who we all uh, finally got to, and, and the Bin Ladens are a very respectable um, construction company, one of the best in the Middle East, and um, working with Caterpillar, working with everyone else, um, and building infrastructure. And the young son, the youngest son, Mohammed Bin Laden, said to me, you know, you've done a lot of work with campaigns, but there's one subject you've never tackled. And I said, well, what? What, what could that be? Peace. You haven't ever addressed the need for a peace movement. And, and that is true, because when we observe that, once in a while, before a country might go to war, there will be a peace march against, against it. Or after the war is won, there, there will be an incipient but very temporary movement to celebrate the peace and, and, and to make it a movement around the world. Uh, but it just never seems to go far. One of the best initiatives recently is done by William Urey. Uh, he wants to bring uh, together uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews uh, to uh, share their common heritage, which is called is from Abraham. In a sense, it's called the Abrahamic uh, uh, path and so on. And uh, people volunteer to go and walk with people from uh, other faiths following where the Bible uh, told the stories that took place. But if any of you, I think what we, if we're gonna build a peace movement, we have to do it with conflict resolution skills and community building skills. It's maybe one community at a time, uh, but that would be uh, far beyond what we do in social marketing, although uh, we would have the same wish to make a better world. I'm going to now end with uh, roughly the social conditioning approach, which could have been called social engineering. Uh, there, there, there is a possible the way of thinking that we will engineer better behaviors by actually uh, training children when they're born to 
be much more, to be better people. Um, and we remember that um, certainly a religion tries to play a social engineering role, if you want to put it that way. Namely, uh, it gives you the precepts and the rituals and the practices that will make you into a good human being according to those religious precepts. But it even took a psychological approach under behavioralism, behaviorism, uh, which was a theory based on, on learning, and learning by, by rewards and punishment, basically, by what they call operant conditioning. Uh, so that uh, starting going way back to pa Pavlov and how he could train a dog to uh, do anything uh, uh, in, connecting, in connection with uh, a, a bell ringing. He can ring a bell and the dog will salivate because he'll know it's now, he's been trained to know that means he's about to eat. Uh, but B.F. Skinner went the furthest to try to raise his own child in what was called an air crib. So everything would be engineered uh, to produce a child who was a very good child. But then it gets to the very bad side when it becomes the national socialism movement in Germany or social, Soviet communism or Taliban. And so this goes both ways, this what we call social conditioning. So the final question that I'd like to leave you with is this, uh, if I can get back to that. Um, there we go. Um, should social marketing stay where it is mainly, which is, I think, still downstream, and please, if you're doing good, good downstream work, wonderful, keep it up, uh, or should we start putting a little more into uh, upstream? And what about uh, inventing technologies that help people behave better without them being uh, coerced or persuaded? Um, and then how about our relationship to social movements? Uh, there's a blurry line between social marketing and social movements, and, and what about social conditioning? So I'll stop here, and thank you very much for listening to me. So again, could you raise your hand and we'll get a, a mic to you. Any questions, <coughs> points, challenges you'd like to raise? Okay, can we, can we actually go over here? We'll, we'll come back. Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Monica Pierce and I'm at Rare. Uh, I had a, I think you raised a really interesting point about why there hasn't yet been a social movement for peace. And I'm wondering if the case is because a lot of these environments are in unstable conditions. Do you recommend a safe way to have some sort of social marketing campaign for peace in an area that might have a lot of uh, violence and conflict? Uh, you know, in a sense, that's where this uh, peace movement should start in the midst of a place where there's already such conflict that the only thing that's sensible is to work and negotiate and settle it down and avoid further conflict. Um, I think the problem is that whoever's starting a social, uh, a, a peace movement there is going to be killed probably <laughs> because there's too much each side thinks it's going to gain from war rather than peace. And then if it happens in a peaceful place about a war situation in another place, it, there's no connection between the two. The peace marchers feel good to represent and stand for something, but it doesn't have any effect on the war. So I think it goes back to conflict resolution and, and how we can uh, get, I love the book uh, called Getting to Yes, which is a negotiation approach which should take the two sides and get get to their interests rather than to their personalities and their histories of bad feelings toward each other. You can take one more question, maybe? Yeah, I think we'll do just, just one more. Was there another, another one over here? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lyons from the University of Waterloo. Um, I have about 20 students here with me today. Um, maybe you could put up your hands if you're a student. You don't have to be from the University of Waterloo, but just in general. There should be about 20 hands up or else you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, that's good. 
Um, I teach social and green marketing, marketing of sustainability. I was just wondering, I guess my question for you is, what, uh, and you've talked about a lot of things to read, um, what Kotler or non-Kotler reading would you recommend for students to either inspire them to get interested in social marketing, or about your last question, like where should mar social marketing go? Yeah, um, as far as uh, reading, um, Nancy Lee and I, uh, are in, published the fourth edition of social marketing and, and the fifth is now under preparation. So I think that's a good start. If you want another view, uh, a fantastic book just came out from Craig Lefebvre about uh, his social marketing. He, who's, he's been working in this field for a long time and I would recommend that. That's uh, maybe a, lo a larger book and much more uh, into a lot of depth about how the field is working. So those are two readings, and maybe get them into some a aspect like the health or the education aspect uh, too. As far as where we should be, how, how, how do we do upstream more? Uh, there you're gonna have to have more uh, skills in lobbying, because remember, I've always defined lobbying as a marketing exercise. It, the target market happens to be legislators. And we know a lot about every single legislator. We know what they eat for breakfast. There, there's a handbook almost that you can find somewhere in Washington that will tell you that the, the hot button to get Senator X to be in, even available, but to be interested in issue Y is the following. So lobbying skills. And then I, gotta, I think we have to use more PR, public relations, because the media still is conditioning our are thinking about what are the industry, uh, 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 what are the issues we're all facing, and even uh, representatives, when they see something hot, they're, they're going to have to take a position on it. So we may force positions by a lot of good PR and uh, lobbying work. Uh, but thank you again. Uh, we're all for change, good change. Thank you. <laughs>